Well, good morning, Priscilla Baptist Church. Good to be with you once again as we gather together in this format to gather around God's Word. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 4 again today. We're going to be in John chapter 4. Uh, the title of the message today is He is Worthy. He is Worthy. Uh, this is a kind of the conclusion of the last week, uh, the stranger at the well or the woman at the well, the stranger being Jesus, whom this woman meets. And uh, we see the conclusion of that. It's kind of the after story, what takes place after this meeting. Uh, so we kind of uh, sometimes we don't get the after story, but on this occasion we do. John gives us the uh, the complete uh, beginning to end from the very beginning of their meeting to the end of their their time together. And so we, we have a conclusion that's here. So it's really interesting to see what we have. And last week, uh, here's some things that we looked at. If you were here, uh, if you watched the video, um, here's the points from last week is that Jesus knows right where you are. He knew where that woman was. She was in Samaria. She was not able to come to him, so he came to her. And Jesus knows right where you are in the midst of your sinfulness. And he comes to you. We could not attain our uh, achievements. by Through our achievements, we could not attain salvation. We could not reach God through our own efforts. So God came to us. And that's a beautiful thing we see. The second thing is Jesus is the living water for thirsty souls. Uh, our souls are thirsty. For the things, uh, we, we, we try to satisfy it with the things of this world, but there's a thirst of the soul that is given to us by God. It can only be satisfied by God. Uh, we need the Lord. We need Jesus. And he is the one who satisfies that thirsty soul. Not the things of this world, but Jesus himself. Only Jesus can satisfy the thirst in your heart. Uh, the third thing is this. Jesus knows your sin. He knows our sin. He knows our sinfulness. And in the, even in the, uh, yet while we were still yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. It's a beautiful thing to see, as Romans points, uh, the, Paul points out in the book of Romans. So a uh, wonderful thing to see that he knows our sin, yet he's come to us. Uh, Jesus knew the sinfulness of the Samaritans. He knew their lostness. He knew that they were half-breeds. He knew that they were without God, and yet he came to them anyway. And then the same thing with us, that he knows our sin, yet he comes to us anyway. To save us from our sin. That's the fourth point. Jesus came to save you and not to shame you. He's come to save us. He, he knows our sin full well and he exposes our sin. The Holy Spirit convicts us, exposes our sin. And the whole purpose of that is not to shame us, but to have us feel the weight of that sin. Feel the weight, weightiness of a sinning against a holy God. And so therefore we can repent of that sin, confess that sin and turn to Jesus Christ. And so that is the uh, the, the whole uh, story of last week, looking at this woman at the well, uh, Jesus pointing out her sinfulness of her many divorces and living with a man currently who's not her husband and those types of things. He exposes her sin and then tells her, look, God's looking, the Father is looking for true worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. In other words, being exposed to the light and coming to him and worshiping in a, with a, a true spirit, a born-again spirit that is uh, seeking God in truth, the true, the one true God. And, uh, and so that's kind of how it ended last week, uh, seeing those things. And so this week is a little different. Um, later there again, we get the back story or the after story uh, to see what, what's taking place with this woman. What happens? Does she just go back to her old life? Uh, does she just, you know, just give up and say, well, you know, this is not for me and, and just goes on? Or what takes place? Well, let's read John chapter 4, beginning in verse 27. I'm going to read John chapter 4, verse 27 through 42. Verse 27 says, Then just then his disciples came back, and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said to him, Who, who do you, or what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? And so the woman left her jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out to town, of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, which you do not know about. And so the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may re, uh, rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. 
I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word that you have given to us, that you are the Savior of the world. And Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and our minds, Lord, to show us who you are. Lord, give us what we do not have and show us what we do not know. Lord, may you lead us in your word today. And Father, that you would bless our souls and Lord, that we would glorify you. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. We're getting into this passage. Uh, that's the, the theme there. The main, main point of this passage is found there in verse 42. This indeed is the Savior of the world. This indeed is the Savior of the world. That phrase changes everything. This is not just a Jew. If you notice the progression from last week to this week of how this woman refers to Jesus, first she refers to him as a Jew. Then she refers to him as sir. And then she refers to him as prophet. Then she refers to him as Christ, as the Messiah. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the Christ? Then it's referred, he's referred to as the Savior of the world. You see this progression. And once you get to that point, this Savior of the world, that is, that is huge. That is big. That, that, that for us as Christians, that, that gives us the whole message of who Jesus is and what he's called us to do, that he is the Savior of the world. This is big. Jesus has come to save sinners from hell, to change their lives, to change their direction, to put them on a new path and a new course. If we believe this is true, then he is worthy of our faith. He's worthy of our lives. And he's worthy of our testimony. He is worthy. Title of the message, He is Worthy. There's a, there's a wonderful song written by Andrew Peterson. And the chorus of this song goes like this. And the title is, of the song is, Is He Worthy? And the, the chorus says this, is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is. He is. He is worthy. Jesus Christ is worthy of our testimony. He is worthy of our efforts of evangelism. He is worthy of us to go out and to share the good news of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. That's what this, this whole message is about this morning. That's what this passage is about. Here's a woman who comes from a dire situation of living this lifestyle that is bound for hell in her sins. And she meets this stranger at the well and he gives her the good news. He gives her this living water and she accepts this living water. And what does she do? She goes out and she shares her testimony. She shares the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for her. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is the savior of the world and he is worthy of us going out and sharing with the world, sharing with them that Jesus is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the one to save us from our sins and from death and from hell. So he is worthy. Jesus is worthy. So number one, be, cur be courageous with your testimony. Be courageous with your testimony. Notice what it is. The disciples come back. Disciples come back to Jesus and, and they're, they're there. They won't even say to him, it says there in the scriptures, they marvel that he was talking with this woman. But no one said to him, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? They're not speaking to Jesus. They're just kind of at all that he's talking with this Samaritan woman by himself, right? Well, what does this woman do? What is this woman? You see the, 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 the disciples, they keep their trap shut. But what does this woman do? She's courageous with her testimony. Look what it says in verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, she started talking to the people. These are people who had rejected her. These are people who would isolate her. These are people who would not normally talk to her. So what does she do? She's courageous with her testimony and goes to the people who have rejected her. 
She, why? Why would she do this? Because she's met the Savior of the world. He's the one who told her, what did she say? Come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Could this be the Christ? Now here, this woman is in no position to make a theological statement because of her sin, because of her reputation. She wants them to see. You come and see. Come, see if this is the Christ. He's the one who's told me all that I have done, and he showed me love. He showed me love. He gave me living water. This is the Christ. See, here's the thing, is that your testimony crosses all barriers, cultural barriers, stereotypical barriers, ethnic barriers. Uh, you know, here's, here's the thing. When you begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, of him being the savior of the world, it crosses all barriers. Color is not a barrier. Ethnicity is not a barrier. All these things come down when you begin to share the gospel of the Savior, not of just Americans, not of just white folks, not of just Westerners. He is the Savior of the world. This woman sees that. Although he's a Jew, he is the Savior of the world, the Savior of Samaritans, the Savior of Jews, the Savior of Gentiles. He is the Savior of the world. He is worthy of us being courageous with our testimony to cross those barriers to whatever it is. A few years ago, I was at the Daytona 500. I love racing. I love NASCAR. You probably know that. And I was doing some ministry at the 500. I was actually outside of the racetrack in the camping area, and we were doing some ministry there. And the ministry time had kind of come to a close, and we were still there uh, talking with some folks and ministering to people. And uh, I saw this girl walk in the gate. She walked in through one of the gates that she was coming into that camping area. A car had dropped her off and she walks in. And we had some picnic tables set up. And she comes and she sits, sits by herself at this picnic table. And I saw her there. She it was not anybody that, that would, normally you would think would be coming to a Christian event. In other words, here we were, it was labeled that we were doing ministry, we were doing outreach. And here she comes and sits at a table at a Christian event and just looking at and there again, being stereotypical, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, judging her really, you know, is what I was doing. I was looking at her hair between her hair, uh, her piercings, all of these different things. I could tell uh, this is probably not somebody that you see typically at a church on Sunday morning. And so I went over there and I started to talk to her. Obviously, she lives in a different lifestyle, different context than I am. And I began to share with her. I said, Are you, is everything okay? She said, I'm, I'm, my, I'm working as a vendor uh, selling hot dogs or whatever in the, in, the, uh, in the racetrack. But my shift doesn't start for an hour. And my mom dropped me off. This young girl, she's probably 18, 19 years old. Her mom had dropped her off ahead of time, and she was just there waiting. And so I began to ask questions. I began to ask her questions. She was very hesitant at first. Who's this guy want to talk to me? All right, Much like this woman at the well. And I began to ask her questions. And the more I began to ask her questions, uh, the more she began to open up. And it began to where now, after a few minutes, she was asking me questions. She was asking me questions about heaven, about Jesus, about what it means to be a Christian. And I sat there with her for probably about an hour and a half just sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with her. Now she was not ready to make a decision at that point, but the seeds were planted. I don't know whatever has happened to that young lady. Unlike this passage, I, I don't have the backstory. I don't have the continuation of what's taken place in her life. I pray for her uh, and that Lord would uh, touch her heart if he hasn't already, that she would be saved. But here's the thing. Here's a girl that comes from a totally different context from me. But yet we were able to have a conversation based on my testimony to begin with and talking about Jesus Christ who will save the, the world. Doesn't matter. You don't have to come from a Christian background. You don't have to come from a, a world that you're just in. You're, you're a good person. You're, this is about a savior of the world who's come to seek and to save the lost. Be courageous with your testimony. In other words, when you look at people, don't say, well, they probably won't hear. Now, this woman, she, when she looks at the people of her town, she knows that these are people that have looked down on her. But yet she goes to them because of the power of Jesus Christ, that he is the one who takes away her sins. And if, if, if Jesus can take away her sins and give her the living water, what about them? They may not. She may have looked at those people and said, those are good people. I'm the bad person. And if Jesus will save a bad person, man, what would he do for a good person? And so he, she's courageous with her testimony. Notice what she does, too. She, she speaks to those who are closest to her. She goes to the people of her town. 
There again, our, our Who's Your One campaign, that's still going on. I know we're in the midst of, of, of coronavirus and lockdowns and this, that, and the other, but hey, be praying for your one. Call your one. Write a letter to your one. Share the gospel with that person. Just because the, the, the things of the world are, are have changed doesn't mean the gospel has changed or the urgency of the gospel has changed. Be courageous with your testimony. Share it with those who are closest to you, your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, your coworkers, those who are around you, who know that you're a Christian, who know that you have something different, that you live a different life, that you have a one that you will follow, that you go to church or you would go to church if you could. These are the people that know that you're a Christian. What is the message that you have? Be courageous with your testimony. Speak to those, begin with those who are closest to you. Here's the thing, is that she didn't focus on the personal cost. She could have been rejected immediately. She probably could have been dragged in front of a city council or something and saying, who are you? And what are you doing? You don't talk to people like us. At, 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 she didn't consider the cost of her personal cost to go out and share the gospel with these people. She was not focused on her personal cost. She was courageous with her testimony. She was proclaiming. And then what did she do? She just proclaims her testimony. Notice what it says here in, uh, in verse 30, 39. Many Samaritans came from that town and believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Did you get the impact of that? Many people from that town believed in Jesus Christ. In other words, that word believe is pastuo in the Greek. They, they had faith. They came to saving faith. Why? Because of the woman's testimony. They believed in Jesus. They didn't believe in her. It's not about her. They believed in Jesus, but she is an integral part in their belief. Why? Because of her testimony. That's what the scripture says. Because of the woman's testimony, he told me all that I ever did. They're seeing this. This is somebody different. She's saying this is, could be the Messiah. And they go and they hear and they believe. It says many Samaritans in that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Man, listen to Romans chapter 10, verse 13 and 14 says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe on him who ha whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? You know, did this woman go and gather a pulpit and gather a crowd and sit in front of her and, and sing three songs, take up an offering, and she began to preach? No, that word preaching, it just means proclaiming. How are they to know? How are they to believe if no one goes and proclaims the good news? That's what this woman did. She went proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and her little faith that she had, her little knowledge that she had, she had not gone to training for evangelism. She'd not been to seminary. She had not done all these things that we have today of training us for evangelism, and then we never go. No, she has her testimony of what Jesus Christ has done for her. She's courageous with her testimony. Y'all, Jesus, he is worthy. He is worthy. And so we were to be courageous with our testimony. Jesus has come and he saved you. If he saved you, then you have a testimony. Be courageous with that testimony. Not thinking of the personal cost. Not thinking of what you might happen, of might be rejected. But looking and seeing people who need Jesus Christ. People that need to meet the Savior. Jesus is worthy. So point number two is this. Rearrange your priorities. Rearrange your priorities. Uh, verse 31, uh, the disciples, they've come back and, and they're talking to Jesus and it says there in verse 31, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? They're not getting it. They're, they're, they're thinking on the physical. Thinking on the physical things. And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. See, we're not to be so focused on the physical, so focused on the things of this life, that life overtakes our evangelism. See, our testimony, our evangelism is to be a part of our life. It's a part of our life. It's not just something that you schedule that will go on Tuesday evenings and, and do that. We've had those programs in the church before. and There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. 
But I believe that Jesus has called us to go, therefore, and make disciples. And when that go, therefore, as go and make disciples means as you go, make disciples. As you live your life, as you're at work, as you're at home, as you're in your community, and as you're in your clubs or whatever it is that you're a part of, as you're around lost people, make disciples, share the gospel, share your testimony. Don't be so focused on the physical things that life becomes so complicated and so busy and so focused on us and so focused on our things that we forget about the big picture. That's the thing. The disciples were so focused on dinner. They couldn't see the miracle that was taking place. They, they didn't ask Jesus, now, who was that woman? What? She ran off and left her jar. Jesus, what, what did you say to this lady? What, what happened? They, they didn't even care. They were so focused on eating that they didn't see the miracle that was taking place of a changed life of this woman who takes off running, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. They're like, hey, Jesus, you going to eat? Hey, man, we're, we're hungry. You got to be hungry too, man. Here, have some of this. And Jesus is like, guys, you're so focused. Your priorities are wrong. You're so focused on the things of this world. You're so focused on your stomach that you can't see this woman's heart. It's been changed. She's a new life. It's a new woman. She's not the same. Focus on the when we focus on the physical, it really gets us off track, especially in the church. We we focus on the physical things and of carpet colors and room temperatures and what songs we sing. We get so focused on the physical things that we lose the bigger picture that we come together as a church to be the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is to do the, the work of Christ. What does Jesus say? My food is to do the will of him who sent me. To do what? To accomplish his work. That's what we are here to do. Jesus has passed the baton to us. As we are his followers. As we are the Christians, the, the little Christ. That he, has, he has given us this commission to go and to make disciples and to be a body of believers who are on mission to do the will of the Father, that is, to expand the kingdom of God. There are people that are dying and going to hell, and God has commissioned us to go to them with the good news that Jesus is the Savior of the world. There's a, I believe, a spiritual starvation is taking place in the church. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. This spiritual starvation that I'm talking about in the church, I believe that there's people in our churches who, who are Christians, no doubt. But it's the, it, there's something that they know is not fulfilling. There's, it's, just, it's not there. There's something missing, even though they're saved. That there's something that is lacking in their life. And is a spiritual starvation. It's going around spiritually hungry for more. There's got to be more to this. Is this what it means to be a Christian? To just go to church and, and to, to spend a few minutes in Bible study and, and to spend some a few minutes in prayer and, and to, to go on Wednesday night and to do another Bible study and another study and another study and, and just is this this this, this uh, rotation that we get into? Is this it? I believe there's a spiritual starvation for something more. And I believe this is what it is. What, we're, what are we starving for? I believe it's sharing the gospel. It's being a, taking our testimony to the world. When we look at our lives as Christians, we say, man, this seems too simple. This seems too routine. I believe there's what we're, here's what we're hungry for. We're hungry for the adventure that comes through sharing our testimony and sharing the gospel with the world around us. We don't need another Bible study. Those are good. We don't need another revival. Those are good. We don't need another sermon. Those are good. What we need to do is share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because when we begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible studies, the revivals, the sermons, they begin to take another impact in our lives. It's another dimension that opens up within us. Why? Because our hearts are focused that I'm going to share the gospel this week. I'm going to share the, my testimony with someone today, this week. I'm going to share the good news of Jesus Christ, and, and I want to be together with the family of God and encourage one another and learn more about God than go out and impact the world with this message. See, when that's at your heart, you're no longer starving for something inside of you. you. You have unleashed this aspect that God has got, that you have pinned up, that you're suppressing, that God wants you to unleash into this world. That's our testimony. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. There's a gospel urgency. 
There's a gospel urgency. We need to rearrange our priorities to see this gospel urgency that is there. What does Jesus say? He says there in verse 35, Do you not say there yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. I mean, you can just imagine, because it says later on that the people of the town began to come out to Jesus. And you can just imagine these people and their culture and their their wardrobe in those days was mostly white, light colored clothing and tunics and, and robes. And here these people are coming out, coming across the fields, coming to Jesus at this well. Now, Jesus, I'm sure, is pointing at them and saying, look, the fields are white unto harvest. And you see these myriads of people dressed in white coming towards them. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, hey, look, don't miss the big picture. Jesus, is he's done the work. What does it say there? He says, verse 36, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. Here the saying holds true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, look, I did the work. God does the work in people's hearts. You reap the harvest. It's not up to you to save people. It's up to you and I to be responsible in our, in our uh, joining with God and what he's doing. We are responsible for sharing our testimony and God is doing the work behind the scenes. We don't know where the Holy Spirit is moving. Remember back in John chapter three, when he's talking to Nicodemus and he said, the spirit is like the wind. You don't know from where it blows. You don't know where it comes from, where it's going. You just see its effects. That's what he's talking about. The Holy Spirit is working on people's lives. They may be hard and calloused and putting up a a, a show and a front. I don't want to hear those things. I'm not a church going person, but I'm telling you, you don't know how the Spirit is working on that person's life. Today, they may be hard hearted. Tomorrow, they may be ready for the gospel. You don't know. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit is already working in people's hearts. We're to be responsible to go out and share our testimony, share the good news of Jesus Christ, and reap the the harvest of what God is doing. God's doing the work behind the scenes, and we don't always see it. Sometimes we do. Hey, pick that low-hanging fruit. If you're talking with someone and they're like asking you spiritual questions and asking you why do you go why do you go to church? Why are you a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? Hey, you can see the Holy Spirit's working in their life. People don't ask those questions unless God is working in their life. People do not seek after God. God seeks after people. And if people are asking spiritual questions, that means God has been working in their hearts. Hey, that's the open door, man. Go through that door. Go to them. But those as well who have no spiritual questions, begin to plant that seed and see what the Holy Spirit does in their life. Begin to see that harvest. Reap that harvest. Here's one of the wonderful things is that in this county, we can say, well, you know, uh, people are just hard hearted and there's drugs in this community and people are not living a godly life anymore. And this, that, you know, the, the culture is just going down the tubes. And you don't know. God is bigger than that. God is bigger than our culture. God is bigger than than the things that we see around us. God has overcome those things. Jesus is worthy. He is worthy of our efforts and our testimony to join with him to do the father's work to do the will of him who sent us and to accomplish his work. At the end of John, John chapter 15, Jesus says, as the father has sent me, so send I you. We have been sent to do the will of the father, to do his, to accomplish his work. Is there a gospel urgency? See, here's the thing is the world gets darker and darker as it gets worse and worse. The urgency of the gospel becomes greater and greater. The darker the world becomes, the more visible and glorious the cross becomes. Jesus is worthy. He is worthy. So therefore, point number three, trust in the word. Trust in the word. Look at verse 40. It says, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him two days. And he did. Verse 41, and many more believed because of his word. Many more believed because of his word. This woman goes and shares her testimony. And here's Jesus that's still there. And they ask him to stay. And Jesus is sharing with them what he shared with the woman at the well, what he shared with Nicodemus, what he shared with us. That he is the savior of the world. That he is going to accomplish the will of the father. He's going to go to the cross. He will rise again on the third day. And he is going to take the sins of the world upon himself. There's the beautiful message of the gospel. We see as many people come, 
preaching. He's proclaiming the word. Are we proclaiming the word? Are we proclaiming the word to people? Are we just talking about, you know, church stuff? There again, I love church. Church is the, the manifestation of Christ amongst the people. I love the church. But the church is on a mission. The church's mission is to proclaim the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. What are we, what are we leading people to? A church service? Sunday school attendance? Or are we leading them to Christ? What are we talking about? What are we proclaiming? We're proclaiming that Christ, the Savior of the world, that he is the Messiah. That he's come. He's taken upon our sins upon himself. He has given us eternal life. Notice this. I think this is a, this is a ooh, excuse me <laughs> about dropping notes there. I think this is tremendously important. Uh, look at look at verse thirty nine and forty one. The Bible keeps the. I believe this is uh, there's there's something specific in here. What is it? notice the duality that is there? Verse thirty nine. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Verse 41, and many more believed because of his word. I mean, think about that. What is the Bible saying? What is John trying to say? What is the Holy Spirit trying to teach us? That yes, Jesus, because he was physically there and they could physically see him and physically hear him, many more came to him because of his word, because of, of what he was saying to them personally. But also, many Samaritans came to believe because of her testimony. And here, here's the thing is that people saw Jesus and they saw her. And people came to Christ, they came to faith because of both. Because of both. Now, now Jesus is not physically here. So how much more weight does that put on her testimony? If Jesus had left Samaria, but they saw the changed life of this woman, they heard her testimony and now she's a different person and that's all they had? I believe the Bible would have said, and many more became to Christ to believe because of her testimony. But here, the Bible doesn't exclude her testimony and focus only on Jesus. It's a duality. Because of her testimony, many people came to Christ. Because of Jesus and his word, many more came to Christ. Many more believed. But it doesn't exclude. She, her testimony is not thrown out the window. No, it's important. Matter of fact, it's right there with Jesus Christ. It's on the same level as him being there with them. Just the fact that many more came to Christ because he's there physically. But here's the thing is that this woman's testimony, according to the word of God, is placed right there with Jesus. Your testimony. Man, when God the Father looks at us and he sees our testimony, he sees it as the words of Jesus. Hey, here's the reason why. Your testimony, my testimony, is not about me. It's not what I've done. It's what Jesus has done. For me, that's what Jesus has done for you. That's our testimony. It's all about Jesus. And so God will, he will exalt that. Why? Because it's about his son. And God exalts the message of his son. Well, where are you today? Where do you, it says that the people believed. Do you believe? Are you saved? If you have not come to Christ in a saving relationship, today can be the day of salvation. Confess your sins. Repent that you are a sinner. Or confess that you are a sinner. Repent of those and turn from those sins. Ask Jesus to save you, to take away your sins and to be your Savior today. You can cry out to him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here's the other thing. Do you believe? Do you believe that he is worthy? Do you believe that Jesus is worthy of you going out and sharing your testimony? Is your salvation worth going out and sharing with others what God has done for you? I believe that it is. I believe that you have a, a heart that has a desire to share the good news, to share your testimony. Go and do it. Make that commitment to Jesus Christ that he is worthy. He is the Savior of the world. That's how this passage ends. Notice what it says, verse 42. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. When we begin to share our testimony, share the gospel of Jesus Christ, God does a powerful work in people's hearts and lives. And we are just at awe and amazed at what he has done. And he is worthy of our testimony. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you have done in our lives, Lord, as we come to you in faith and we have placed our lives before you. And Father, you have sent your son, Jesus, to save us. And Lord, we placed our faith in him. 
Lord, that you would empower us. Lord, we know that the Holy Spirit is empowering us to share our testimony. Lord, may we do it. Lord, help us to, to, to be courageous with our testimony. Lord, rearrange our priorities to see the harvest. Lord, Lord may we trust in your word that you are working. Lord, that you have called us to be the messengers of the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we be faithful because you are worthy. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in this week. And until next time, uh, I just pray that the Lord will continue to bless you and go and share your testimony. Amen. Until next time, God bless.